We have a highly complex and immensely powerful immune system, and as they say, with great power, comes great responsibility. Well, our immune system do a pretty good job at it, until, it fails. In some people, our immune system lost its mind and start attacking themselves. that's when we call it the enemy within. Today we are going to talk about a similar condition, where our immune system attacks the most important system of our body, nervous system. Our brain contains tiny little cells called neurons. Neurons are the structural and functional units of our nervous system. Our neurons are made up of three parts, mainly, a cell body, dendrites, and an axon. Myelin is an insulating layer, or sheath that forms around nerves, including those in the brain and spinal cord. It is made up of protein and fatty substances. This myelin sheath allows electrical impulses to be transmitted quickly and efficiently along the nerve cells. If myelin is damaged, these impulses slow down. CNS myelin is produced by special cells called oligodendrocytes. PNS myelin is produced by Schwann cells. The two types of myelin are chemically different, but they both perform the same function, to promote efficient transmission of a nerve impulse along the axon. Sometimes, your immune system attacks the myelin sheath or the cells that produce and maintain it. This attack causes inflammation and injury to the nerve sheath and ultimately to the nerve fibers that it surrounds. This condition is called multiple sclerosis, or MS. MS affects approximately 1 million individuals in the US and 2.5 million worldwide. Initial symptoms typically occur between 20 and 50 years of age, and women have about three times increased likelihood of developing MS compared with men. MS is an autoimmune disease where the body is unable to distinguish between healthy cells and antigens. MS begins with recurrent bouts of CNS inflammation, which causes damage to both the myelin sheath covering axons, and the axons themselves. When we cut the brain of patients with MS, there are areas of severe demyelination, reduced axonal and oligodendrocyte numbers, and glial scarring. On histologic examination, it shows up as indurated patches in pathologic specimens, so it's called sclerosis, since the multiple patches, multiple sclerosis. To understand the pathophysiology of MS, we must understand how our immune system works. We have discussed beautifully how immune system works, you can watch the video in description below. For now, just a quick overview. When a foreign body enters our system, our immune system plays its role. The first encounter is antigen receptor cells or antigen-presenting cells. Dendritic cells are professional antigen-presenting cells that play an important role in promoting the activation and differentiation of naive T cells. Microglia are a type of neuroglia, glial cells, located throughout the brain and spinal cord. Microglia account for 10 to 15 percent of all cells found within the brain. As the resident macrophage cells, they act as the first and main form of active immune defense in the central nervous system. When these microglial cells are presented with pathogens, they get activated and release cytokines, and start phagocytosis by activating immune effector T cells then activate T cells. Activated T cells can then cross the blood-brain barrier and result in a peripheral immune response. Paravascular T cells can secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, including interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Antibodies against myelin also may be generated in the periphery or intrathecally. Ongoing inflammation leads to epitope spread and recruitment of other inflammatory cells, that is bystander activation. Activated microglia may release free radicals that is nitric oxide, and proteases that may contribute to tissue damage. The cause of MS is unknown, but it is likely that a number of variables interact to develop or sustain this condition. It has been proposed that MS develops when an environmental agent or event, for example, a viral or bacterial infection, chemical exposure, or a lack of sun exposure, interacts with a genetic predisposition to immune dysfunction. 
The sine qua non of MS is that symptomatic episodes are separated in time and space, that is, episodes occur months or years apart and affect different anatomic locations. Depending on which region of the brain is involved, symptoms vary in MS from patient to patient. For example, a patient may arrive with hand paresthesias that resolve, only to be followed a few months later by leg weakness or eye problems, for example, diplopia. Furthermore, the onslaught should last longer than 24 hours. MS symptoms may differ amongst persons. Some individuals come with prominent ataxia, hemiparesis or paraparesis, depression, or visual symptoms, whereas optic neuritis, fatigue and essential tremors. A doctor will give you a diagnosis of MS if there's clear evidence that at two different points in time, you've had separate episodes of disease activity in your CNS. There are four stages of MS in general. Clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and last, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. First, clinically isolated syndrome. This is the first episode of symptoms caused by inflammation and damage to the myelin covering on nerves in the brain or spinal cord. Technically, CIS doesn't meet the criteria for a diagnosis of MS, as it's an isolated incident with only one area of damage to the myelin sheath responsible for symptoms. If an MRI shows another episode in the past, a diagnosis of MS can be given. Next, the relapsing remitting type of MS. It generally follows a predictable pattern, with periods in which symptoms worsen and then improve. Eventually, it may progress to secondary progressive MS. According to the National MS Society, around 85% of people with multiple sclerosis receive an initial diagnosis of RRMS. People with relapsing remitting type have flare-ups or relapse of MS. Between the relapses, they have periods of remission. Over a few decades, the course of the disease is likely to change and become more complex. RRMS can progress into a more aggressive form of the disease. Some of those with the relapsing remitting form of the condition will go on to develop SPMS. This generally happens within 10 to 25 years of the first diagnosis. In SPMS, people may still experience relapses. These are then followed by partial recoveries or periods of remission, but the disease doesn't disappear between cycles. Instead, it steadily worsens. Approximately 10% to 15% of people receive a diagnosis of a relatively uncommon form of the disease, called primary progressive MS. This form of MS is characterized by slow and steady disease progression with no remission periods. Some people with PPMS experience occasional plateaus in their symptoms as well as minor improvements in function that tend to be temporary. There are variations in the progression rate over time. There is no specific test to rule out MS and it requires ruling out similar conditions before diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Few tests may include Spinal tap In which a small sample of cerebrospinal fluid is removed from your spinal canal for laboratory analysis. This sample can show abnormalities in antibodies that are associated with MS. A spinal tap can also help rule out infections and other conditions with symptoms similar to MS. Next MRI MRI can reveal areas of MS or lesions in the brain and spinal cord. You may receive an intravenous injection of a contrast material to highlight lesions that indicate your disease is in an active phase. Next evoked potential tests Evoked potential tests record the electrical signals produced by your nervous system in response to stimuli. An evoked potential test may use visual stimuli or electrical stimuli. In these tests, you watch a moving visual pattern, or short electrical impulses are applied to nerves in your legs or arms. Electrodes measure how quickly the information travels down your nerve pathways. There is no cure for multiple sclerosis. Treatment typically focuses on speeding recovery from attacks, slowing the progression of the disease and managing MS symptoms. 
Some people have such mild symptoms that no treatment is necessary. The most commonly used medicines in MS are, corticosteroid. Corticosteroids, such as oral prednisone and intravenous methylprednisolone, are prescribed to reduce nerve inflammation. Side effects may include insomnia, increased blood pressure, increased blood glucose levels, mood swings and fluid retention. Next, plasmapheresis. The liquid portion of part of your blood, plasma, is removed and separated from your blood cells. The blood cells are then mixed with a protein solution, albumin, and put back into your body. Plasma exchange may be used if your symptoms are new, severe, and haven't responded to steroids. The drugs used in MS include, ocrelizumab. For primary progressive MS, ocrelizumab is the only FDA-approved disease-modifying therapy or DMT. Those who receive this treatment are slightly less likely to progress than those who are untreated. Ocrelizumab is given via an intravenous infusion by a medical professional. Infusion-related side effects may include irritation at the injection site, low blood pressure, a fever, and nausea, among others. Some people may not be able to take ocrelizumab, including those with a hepatitis B infection. Ocrelizumab may also increase the risk of infections and in some types of cancer, particularly breast cancer. For relapsing remitting MS, several disease-modifying therapies are available. Interferon beta medications. These drugs are among the most commonly prescribed medications to treat MS. They are injected under the skin or into muscle and can reduce the frequency and severity of relapses. In recent years, scientists have made rapid progress in developing drugs and treatments for MS. Newer drugs are safer and more effective, and they offer significant hope for slowing disease progression. A person who receives appropriate treatment and follows a healthful lifestyle can expect to live the same number of years as a person without MS. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and support us to learn more. Thank you.